Hi, everyone, and welcome to the survey reporting and its application workshop conducted by Kevin Bomelant. I'm Sue Boffman from ARL, and very pleased to welcome everyone here this afternoon. And as we were just talking about chrysanthemums and pumpkins, I hope everyone is having a good fall. Today's workshop is part of our series of training opportunities for the Research Library Impact Framework Initiative. It is the last in the quantitative research series uh, today, uh, and our thanks to all of you who have attended the workshop since the beginning of 2021. It's hard to believe it's been 10 months since we started our workshops. Uh, as is our practice, the session is being recorded and we will share the recording slides and any other documentation that Kevin will have with everyone following the second session, which is going to be held on Thursday, October 14th. Um, as always, you are welcome to share the materials with colleagues who could not attend one of the sessions. Uh, so with that brief intro and hello, Kevin, let me turn the virtual podium over to you. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Sue. Just get my screen shared. So before I get started, I just wanted to remind everyone if they have a question to feel free to, to interrupt me verbally. I'll be monitoring the chat, but sometimes it's hard for me to, to focus on that with the presentation. So go ahead and jump in with any questions. And so today I'll be covering survey reporting and its application with some advanced methods and statistical analysis. So um, if you're able to you know, attend the first three sessions, this is the capstone when we put everything together. Um, so I'll review the workflows that I use to start the project, to get a, a project started, develop a survey instrument, field the survey, conduct the initial analysis, and then the last part is where we get some deeper into some statistics um, so that we can think about how to report to our different stakeholders and what their interests are and how we can represent our, uh, our data in the most effective way. So yes, this is a, this is a life cycle. So I work on a, a yearly schedule where typically I'm asking the same uh, population for their opinion every single year, which could be the case for you. Um, it could be more often or less often depending on if you are interested in learning about a specific intervention or event that you've planned. Um, I've also done those as well, where I'm matching the, um, the, re the respondent data at the level of the individual across 10 or 12 events over a year long period for a seminar series. So all of this applies um, to any sort of timeline, but uh, I think that the life cycle approach is helpful so that you can think about um, the end of your project when you're getting your conclusions that you're already thinking about changes or, or uh, ways to preserve uh, the data that you have and to use that to drive um, the survey effectively in the next year. So um, the first session we went over web survey design and then uh, data collection and cleaning, which is just getting the project started. Some exploratory data analysis, I'll take you through uh, where we, we, uh, we put uh, composites together, thematic composites, uh, some, some simpler statistics that are still important and that I actually use most often in my survey reporting. Um, a little bit about dashboarding, just to remind you on some visualization techniques that are used in survey, to, in survey projects. And then more time spent in advanced statistical methods, um, particularly weighting versus imputation, and then some regression analysis work. So I have a case study for you um, about survey response rates that I've used in my own work that could be of use to you. It's just nice to um, see how regression is used in an applied fashion um, and some, some other ways that I, I shy away from in survey research. So for, for web survey design, um, this is the part of the project where we're thinking about the research questions. So we have, um, if we're on the yearly cycle, we're thinking about what's important to our stakeholders and what's important internally about what we want to um, monitor opinions about. And so this is when we're operationalizing our, our different um, areas of interest. So if you're interested in library services, you can divide it up into separate, um, separate areas to, to get at in your survey. So that could be specifically interactions with students and staff. It could be about a seminar series. You could ask about opening times um, you could also ask questions specific to different age groups and their interests. 
So you have your, your journal concepts, but at the beginning of the life cycle, you're changing those concepts into a series of questions, um, hopefully in, in an order that's logical. So from most general to most, uh, to most specific, um, so you can guide your, uh, your respondent through your survey in a way that's understandable. And so logically, uh, what you're doing there is you're creating um, gate questions. And those are, um, those are the questions where you're asking if a, if a respondent has experienced a service or has interacted with a staff member. So those questions are, their purpose is to narrow the population for that question to those who are, el who are able and eligible to answer the question at hand. Um, so those are, those are important ways to guide your survey respondent through your survey in a way that you can collect the most useful information. And then it also reduces the burden on the respondent so that um, they're not answering questions that they're not interested in or they don't have an opinion on. Sometimes respondents will feel the need to, to tick a box or, or, or check an answer, um, even if they know that they haven't experienced the, the service because they're, they're in the survey and they're completists, they like to complete everything. Um, and so gate questions are the way to, to monitor that, to, to sort of guide them through the survey in the right way. Um, we also use expository text. So when you're designing your survey, um, scales may be intuitive to you, but it's important to describe them in detail to the respondent and the survey instrument. So um, if you give them the one to 10 scale, some people will be confused about what's, what number corresponds to the most positive feeling. Uh, or if you have uh, something like never, sometimes, usually, or always, you can go into a little bit more description about what that means. Um, or if you want to orient the, the respondent to a specific time period or to a specific event um, for, a, for a set of questions, that's when you use the expository text to direct them that these are the questions that I would like, this is what I would like you to think about when you're answering these questions. And then skip logic is the other way that uh, we use to manage uh, respondents as they go through the survey. So um, this means that if you if they give a specific answer to a question that makes the, the that um, would make it that reveals that they would not have a relevant answer to a following question, say a gate question that asks them if they've ever visited the library front desk and they say no, then you use skip logic, which skips ahead of those questions into the next um, item on your agenda, which might be software programs that they use in the library. Um, and so when we're thinking about uh, survey research, we're thinking about reliability and validity. Reliability being um, the ability to get the same um, responses uh, from, the, from the same survey over different periods of time. So if a respondent sees one que this question one week and they see it again the second week, they'll interpret it in the same way. And then validity, meaning that we are measuring what we'll think we're measuring, which um, is something that I like to focus on um, both of these topics really when we're dealing with diverse populations and, and they may have different interpretations of questions. And that's why the expository text is so useful. You can only do so much in the question text itself to um, guide the respondent, but the expository text is there to, to help them. And then answer choice scales. So, um, you know, best practices in survey research mean that we want to limit the number of answer choice scales that we use in the survey, but of course it's not practical just to have one or two. Sometimes you want to get um, a finer opinion about a topic, sort of like a, a warmth or coolness rating from a one to 10 scale, or you want to move to a, a, a less fine scale when you just want a, a yes or no answer, um, if they're satisfied or unsatisfied. And that can depend on your preference and just the wording of the question may dictate different answer choice scales. Um, so it's okay to have different answer choice scales in your survey, but best practices um, dictate that you should limit them as much as possible. So I have a few, um, a few examples of questions that I've used. And so the top question, question five, is just a gate question. Have you visited the library in the past year? Yes, no, nobody attended to. And so depending on your, your interpretation um, or your, your, your desire for what um, the next series of questions would be, you could allow nobody attended to, to be in the, uh, to be to answer the next question. But typically I really need that person to have visited the library to be able to answer the next question as in this case. So you don't want people who are, um, who haven't visited the library to answer a question, to answer question number six. So you're skipping, um, you're forcing the people who answered no or no, but I intended to, to skip question six.
And then we, uh, we talked a bit about um, in our earlier sessions about data collection and cleaning. Um, but it is um, something that, that sort of um, kind of escapes attention when, when designing a survey project is the, is the fielding timeline. Um, typically, I'll leave open a survey for uh, at least a month and then send uh, three reminder emails since I typically work with, with web surveys and people who are um, people for whom I have email information. And then this, in this fielding timeline, you know, I'm actually sending emails at different times of day um, on different days of the week or even on the weekend so that I'm catching um, the different segments of the population um, at the time that's convenient for them. So if I send it at the same time every week, it might be the case that I'm only catching um, a certain subpopulation that's not busy at that time is, in the, is at their email. So I definitely encourage you to um, send reminder emails at different times um, to do the best that you can so that everyone has a chance to participate in your survey since you want your uh, survey uh, respondent sample to resemble your population as much as possible, um, both in terms of demographics and age and other demographic characteristics. So for data cleaning, this is another important um, point. Since you want to preserve the, the data that's most relevant to your, um, to your projects, um, so the first thing you want to do is to disqualify respondents who are not in the sample population. And this can happen more than you think if, um, if someone gets forwarded an email um, for, for, with, your, uh, with a link to your survey um, and they have never visited the library or they just um, are not even from your institution, it's possible um, that they went ahead and answered the, uh, went ahead and answered the survey. So a lot of times in my surveys, I ask them to verify their, their email address now, it may also be the case that you don't have any identifying information. Um, and in that case, you, you could use IP address um, in, in SurveyMonkey and other uh, web platforms. There's that option. Um, but just uh, know that that can happen every once in a while, even with web surveys, that you will get someone from outside your sample population to answer the survey. Um, so to do your best to disqualify those respondents as much as you can. Another, another thing that happens quite frequently is that survey respondents may um, submit more than one response. So if they, they'll go, they'll click on the link right when it comes to them, they'll get through halfway through the survey, and then maybe they'll get to the end and actually submit with only answering some of the questions. And then they forgot that they did it or they, they changed their mind about something and realized that they want to take the survey again. They'll click on that link again and go through the, the survey entirely. And so the typical procedure is to actually um, keep the most complete survey. And in cases when um, the respondent has answered the survey twice and answered all the questions is to keep the most uh, recently completed survey. So that's what I, that's what I use to deduplicate. Um, this is an important part since you don't want, um, you don't want to people to have duplicate responses in your, in your data so that you're doubling the importance of their opinion with respect to everyone else. Um, and the, the last thing with data collection and cleaning, um, the last point is about identifying survey completes. So you might take a, a broad view and you want, and this really is dependent on your, your needs and what you want to get out of the project, but you could take the view that you want absolutely everyone's participation in your survey. And as long as they answer a single question, um, you want them included in the data. Um, so that could be just, you have their email address, they, sub they submitted that and they answered one question, you know they're at your institution and they might and they have an opinion that's, that's relevant to your work. So you, you keep that. Um, on the other hand, you might be more strict and you want someone who has, has visited the library and done a few activities. And so you, you might require them to answer several gate questions that yes, they've been to the library, yes, they've done this, and yes, they've done that. So three, quest three gate questions, and that can be enough to qualify for them from the survey. And some other methods are you know, answering half the questions in the survey, which is pretty strict. Um, so I encourage you to you know, think about um, how much participation you want from, um, how much participation you need to be able to get useful information from your respondents and to set a threshold that works, that works for you. Typically I use a certain number of gate questions. So, uh, so yeah, I set, I set a, a threshold this one, for this project. I set at least two gate questions that I had to answer. Um, 
since I, I discovered that um, those who were answering zero or, or one were answering so few questions, um, less than 10% of the entire survey questions that I couldn't, I couldn't justify them having, um, I couldn't justify to the client that they had a, a significant experience with the, the client services. Exploratory analysis. This is um, actually my favorite part of survey research. Um, this is when you start to get, um, start to dive into your research and discover what it is that, um, what it is that you found in, in your research project. So I do want to stress here that um, I do run some statistical analysis analyses in the exploratory work. Um, and that, that's because it, my, if I have enough information, if I'm doing sort of a more of a, a standard survey report, um, it could end here. My project could end here at exploratory analysis. I'm doing my t-tests. I'm looking for correlations. Um, I'm giving a descriptive summary of the mean scores for each, for each question. And that could be enough for the report. So my, my work never goes really beyond this exploratory analysis and doesn't go into the more advanced statistical methods, which is definitely um, a viable path in survey research. Um, so we'll get into some of the more advanced topics before, but I do want to stress that, you know, for your purposes, it could be doing some exploratory analysis could be enough. And then you can move on to statistical method, more advanced statistical methods, if you want to do some more internal quality control, um, as opposed to, to just reporting. And so in exploratory analysis, what I'm doing is I'm going back to my research questions and uh, just reminding myself why it is that I set out to, to um, field the survey. Um, and so um, typically when in my work, it's to find out if um, opinions have changed over time since a lot of this, a lot of the work I do is timeline based. So there's a particular service um, that, um, that's new or that has changed or just um, that my client wants to track how a, a respondent's opinion so that service is changing over time. Um, that's my, my standard res research question. But for you, it might be something like, a, like I've mentioned a few times, a, a seminar series or just some, some point of interest. Um, I, know, I know from reviewing some of your questionnaires that there's a lot of interest in learning about the effect of COVID on, on library operating procedures. And definitely think that's um, of course, a very useful implementation of survey research work is to um, actually use a current event and then catch that catch that data as it comes in. It's really valuable to see how services um, work in times when things aren't running as usual. And then once you get once things return to normal, is to see, you know, is there um, is there any change in that opinion that was affected by that event, or if um, actually somewhat counterintuitively the opinion remained the same. Uh, or what is it that's differently? What what different priorities do students have during during COVID and after COVID? Um, so so timelines can be timeline uh, research questions can be useful. Um, second point here is about is item analysis. And item analysis is just a fancy term for developing um, composites. So composites are groups of questions that are thematically related. Um, so if you're thinking about your survey and your, and your survey structure, right, we're going from most general to least general, but there are different topics that we cover in the survey itself. Um, so the first part might be overall services, the next part might be opening hours, and the third part might be software availability. Um, and so we can create composites that are uh, thematically related questions. So when we design a survey, we already sort of think we know what the, the themes are, but we use this um, the statistic called um, Cronbach's alpha to form these composites of thematically related questions so that we can report these scores in a thematic way instead of at the question level, which is a little bit less, um, which I find really actually helps people who haven't, you know, who, uh, who haven't been involved in designing the survey research product, project to get a better, under, better understanding of what the purpose of the work is for and then to sort of map um, from that, these narrow questions back to the, the research question, the themes that you're interested in talking about with your stakeholders. Um, so yeah, I'll take you through some initial statistical tests um, and exploratory analysis. Um, and then really the purpose is to 
is to do so, is to do this work so that you can formulate a workflow for the next step in your process after visualization, and that's to dive into the advanced statistics um, when you're thinking more about subtle issues about how to report about in, uh, about respondent opinions among different subgroups, how to deal with missing data, um, and then and then biases in non-response, which is something that comes up a lot in survey research since. Um, there are different courses, you know, there are different um, subgroups who traditionally have answered surveys less often than other groups. Um, in my line of work, it's particularly challenging to get um, survey responses from, from Latino respondents. So we're always trying to come up with ways to get broader participation beyond the, the obvious ones of providing um, the survey in different languages. But nonetheless, um, it's still often the case that I get, uh, you know, a different response rate by different subgroups. And there are ways of, of dealing with this um, um, and some ways that um, that are that are, that are well intended, but I think may actually um, may not make the problem better. So I want to I want to cover that in some detail in this in this presentation again um, using regression so that we can find out um, some the method to use and then um, how to employ that method when you're developing your final report so that you can use the right language to describe. Um, uh, how you've gone about doing something like imputation, which is um, a method that we use to uh, deal with missing data. So just where in this presentation, we're really going from uh, sort of broader topics, then we're going to get very specific into dealing with some more common problems in survey research and, and methods to, to resolve those problems, particularly when you're reporting to different stakeholders who have different interests. So yeah, the first the first thing I do um, beyond um, you know doing my descriptive statistics, um, I'm looking at my mean scores. So mean scores just you know you have um, you're getting your question results. And you can see that on your very satisfied to dissatisfied score, a mean score is just um, that translated into a, a one to five scale, and then you make that a numeric value. So if most people have answered very satisfied, your mean score will be about five if you have a perfect score, for example. So that's the first thing I do. Um, but after that, um, I don't make any decisions really based on that. Um, I do an, an item analysis, um, typically an R, which I, use to, which I use to develop composites. So as I mentioned before, these are just thematically related questions. It's not a statistical test, so it's, it's not a hypothesis test. It's really a heuristic that we use to select which questions go into which composites so that when you're reporting your results, you can talk about things like uh, customer service or, um, or what else? We can also think about uh, you know, overall satisfaction or any other sort of concept that maps to what your interests are um, so that we're not reporting um, you know, the answer to, we got the mean score of 2.5 on question 11 about the specific service is harder for people to digest. So, it's both statistically helpful and also conceptually helpful. Um, and so when, you, when you're doing your statistical work, you'll actually, um, this is what you'll, this is some, something you can get out of R, but um, most of the other statistical programs will also give you this nice chart, which gives you the alpha statistic um, for a group of questions. Um, it gives you the, uh, the overall uh, Cronbach's alpha for the group, and then what would happen if you deleted that question? So uh, question four in these imaginary six, these imaginary six questions, um, if you delete that um, question, the alpha goes much higher. So it's suggestive um, that that question shouldn't be included in that composite. Either it could be a standalone question or it could be in a different composite. Um, and I do want to point out that gate questions typically aren't included in these thematic composites. So the ones that ask about have they attended uh, a certain or have they interacted with the service, you can eliminate them from um, the composite immediately um, and then just um, uh, run your statistics on the rest of the questions. So the, the guideline for, for the alpha and this sort of idealized question one through six, those are very high alpha scores. Uh, it's a very high alpha. So anything above a 0 0.5 is typically within the realm of including a question in a composite. But again, it is a heuristic. It's not, it's not you don't use it, to, use it to guide your, decision, your decisions. You don't um, 
have to just rely, uh, you can't just rely on the number itself as a decision maker. It's really um, what you think in combination with the guidance from the alpha statistic. So I've identified my composites. So that means I can move on to um, some other statistical tests. And I actually didn't get to cover this in I think one or two of the, the last um, workshops I had with you all. So I wanted to, to move it back a little bit to the, stu the student's t-test and what it is used for in survey research. Because I've, yeah, I've gotten some questions on this because um, of course when we do a, a survey project, we do some research, we want to find out what is a significant result. Um, a lot of times I'm just reporting mean scores and trends and that can be enough, um, especially when you're doing year on year comparisons. But, there's always the interest in finding a significant difference instead of one that's just um, a trend. Um, but I do want to caution that um, it's difficult to run this, the t-test the on questions within the survey itself. Since I've, I've rarely seen a survey where every single question has the same scale, um, that's one of the assumptions that is needed to be able to run a t-test. So if you have questions that are differently scaled, um, really disqualifies the, the t-test, which is why the most the more useful application of the t-test in survey research is to compare um, is to compare year over year changes in a certain question or a composite, or to make comparisons between subgroups um, within a single survey year. So if you want to know the difference in responses between younger respondents and older respondents, say students versus faculty members, uh, that's, a, that's a, a great use of the t-test. Um, or making comparisons from last year's survey to this year. Um, so I do, I do recommend that we don't, um, even if there are some questions on your survey that have the same scale, it's a bit difficult to, it's hard to report them um, because it's, it's very scattershot. It really depends on the, um, the scales that you use in each question. So if you're only reporting a subset of those questions uh, with a t-test, it can make it, things a little bit more confusing for someone who's reading your report. Um, which is why I, tem I tend not to include that in my work. And I just want to point out that uh, this, is, this involves the, the rejection of the null hypothesis is something that I always, um, I, need, I always like to say that our assumption is that, that there is no significant difference. Um, but as I'm sure many of you know that uh, um, we actually use this test to find if we can reject the null hypothesis that the, the mean scores are, are the same. Just have an example in the next slide of, of a, a mean score comparison. So on my survey, the outcome metric is overall satisfaction. Uh, and then I have it divided into two age groups. So another um, key point in survey research is that even if you haven't um, uh, identified some groups in the beginning of your survey work, the exploratory analysis is really when you can, is really when you can identify those subgroups, right? Um, so, for for race and ethnicity, that's um, that's pretty intuitive. If they if they click um, if they if they choose um, a race or an ethnicity, that's that's what it is. Whereas with an age group, um, it's you can bin it. So if they pick an age twenty three, and you find that you get um, you, you might have an enormous number of respondents in your 20s, depending on your population, whereas um, a similarly sized population would be just 30 and over. In that case, this would be the appropriate binning to do the to run the t-test and find a, and find if there's any significant difference in the mean scores. Um, I will say that um, also, you know, in, in survey research, when I'm when I'm thinking about race and ethnicity, um, there are ways to um, bin different different ethnicities together. Um, so, for example, for for uh, health and human services, where I have some contracts with the, with the government, um, they actually prefer to um, they prefer to to report white respondents and then un, underrepresented underrepresented minority students uh, separately. Um, so I work with with training programs, so they're actually students as well, and so they'll include. Um, uh, white respondents and then Asian respondents and then anyone else who identifies either uh, as a different race, uh, multiple races, uh, or who identifies with the, the Latino ethnicity 
they get included under the designation underrepresented minority. So, you know, even in the even in, in this is common in survey research, if you have um, a question about race and then another question about ethnicity, you can you don't have to think about it too much ahead of time as long as you're you put everything on the survey that you think you need at the end. And then at the end of the survey, you can start to map those uh, those race and ethnicity values together so that you can report them in a way um, that might be standard for your institution um, or for, for a regulatory authority in my case. Or you might, um, you might also find that it's useful to report them entirely separately because you have a very diverse population. You're getting a large number of responses for each subgroup. So that's sort of, um, that's sort of one of the, um, uh, the one of the, the issues that that uh, I typically run into is that I can't report very small subgroups for privacy reasons. So if I get fewer than ten respondents for a certain uh, race or ethnicity subgroup, I can't be reported, which means their opinion isn't being heard on uh, on that particular topic. Um, so there's it's kind of um, dual dual things at work here. So what I end up doing is um, is binning that population. With another with another um, race or ethnicity subgroup under the under the rubric of underrepresented minority, so that their opinion is being counted, um, and that um, yeah they aren't being excluded from the survey process since they took the time to answer the survey, and I want to represent everyone's opinion as as um, as accurately as possible. So yes, just to, yeah, just to stay to to make it clear, you you design your race and ethnicity questions. Um, you don't have to already have it mapped out how you report as long as you get all of your answers that you need um, in advance. Um, and then just one thing that I want to stress about t-tests is that it doesn't help you establish which questions are most important. Um, that is a that's a different statistic that we'll come to, but um, just wanted to to you know emphasize that the main usage is is um, to for mean score comparison across time or across subgroups. So the um, next element of the exploratory analysis is actually the Pearson coefficient. Um, and I find this is very useful. It's probably the, thing, it's probably the statistical test that um, I use the most often in survey research um, since it really builds off of the work that you've done um, with composite development. Um, so you've, you have those thematic composites and you have some, typically have some outcome measure, um, overall satisfaction. And so I want to know, and your stakeholders will probably want to know, what are the aspects of your work that's driving that overall satisfaction or that outcome, that outcome measure? And that's really the, what the Pearson coefficient can do. It can find, um, it will, it can, the, the R squared value, which I'll get to in a second, will tell you um, the amount of variance um, that, the, um, that that thematic composite contributes to the overall correlation. So um, I don't need the equation here, but the important thing to, to remember here is that you're made, it is a hypothesis test, so it's different from the alpha. It's not a heuristic. Um, so you can look for significance measures. You can translate this into a p-value, but I like to report the, the correlation coefficients themselves across all questions together, um, so that we can see we can make comparisons amongst the questions to see what is the biggest driver over, of overall satisfaction of our outcome measure. And in this um, this case that I worked with, uh, you can see the thematic composites that I developed. Um, and then the um, the Pearson coefficient scores for each of the, uh, the 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 two question comparisons. So in this case, customer service was the biggest driver of overall satisfaction. Um, and then the least important was software availability. And I actually yeah, I do encourage that to be reported to to stakeholders um, who whose eyes may glaze over if you report mean scores, um, that can be hard for them to conceptualize. But if they're able to see, if they're able to understand what the name of the thematic composite is and how that relates to the outcome measure, you're really, um, you're really doing their homework for them and it makes, uh, makes your work a lot easier. Yeah, and just to, to emphasize the two different purposes um, 
of these uh, two statistics. So Cronbex alpha, not a hypothesis test, a heuristic and Pearson correlation. Um, it is used in hypothesis testing. Um, so Pearson used to de determine covariance among questions and the alpha is used to make a decision about thematic composites. And so um, the other major difference is that Cronbach alpha is a comparison amongst multiple, uh, multiple questions. So when you're developing your composite, um, and typically historically in, the, in survey research, actually you would put, um, you would actually you put all the survey questions together in the beginning um, because historically surveys are actually a lot shorter. So it was actually, the Cronbach alpha was actually developed as if one survey was one composite. Um, and so you could find your, um, your inter-item reliability for all the items within the survey. But now typically surveys are longer and we have basically little mini surveys within your survey that, it, that get at different concepts. So we're developing several composites of four or five questions or whatever the, the number of questions is within the survey um, based on this, this alpha statistic. Whereas in the Pearson correlation, it's only um, a comparison between two questions. I just want to pull out an example from, from my work in, uh, with both health plan clients about how this, how this can work. Um, so I have my, my outcome question, which is the rating of the health plan. And I'll note that in my, in my question text, I'm explaining what the, what the, the scale means. So using any number from zero to 10, where zero is the worst health plan possible and 10 is the best health plan possible, what number would you use to rate your plan? And then as always, I'm interested in finding out which composite is the strongest driver of the variance in that overall rating question. And so there were two separate groups that I had, subgroups in this, in this um, survey project were types of health plans, so PPO plans versus HMO plans. Whereas you could use any other subgroup, you could do race or ethnicity, um, you could do age groups. In this case, we have health plan. And um, you can see that it actually does make a difference when you divide up the subgroups. So for the PPO plans, claims processing and um, questions related to that topic were the strongest driver of overall satisfaction. So if someone what that means is someone rated um, those questions highly in claims processing, they were um, also likely to answer highly on the overall rating, whereas for some of the lower, the, the less correlated ones, so submitted claims to plan questions, that wasn't as an important driver. There wasn't as strong of a correlation between a high score on those questions versus the rating of health plan question. Um, and so for the HMO POS plans, um, rating of specialists happened to be the most important. So I actually do report the, the R squared value um, as a percentage for, for clients to help them understand what percentage um, of the variance can be explained by answers to a certain composite. So um, this is just a way to, to mentally compare how important something is, um, which I think, I think is useful for, for people who you know, haven't done the survey research along with you, but are simply looking at your report. So um, this way they can see that claims processing accounts for 20% of the variance in the overall satisfaction um, to the PPO and EPO group. So I do wanna take um, a second, I just wanna pause there for uh, a few seconds to ask for any questions before I jump into visualization and into some advanced statistical methods. Um, there can be questions on the presentation yourself. We do, I think we have a little bit more time in this presentation. So if you have questions that relate to your individual project, you can either answer, ask them now or feel free to at the end of the presentation. Okay. So um, one of our sessions was about uh, visualization and, and tabulation. Um, my method, I, I use a, a few different software programs, um, Tableau and R typically, but um, you know, the point here is that um, we're making our visualizations, um, really there, there's, two, there's two separate approaches to, to visualization and that's dashboarding where the dashboard um, doesn't have a lot of text and you're simply reporting probably mean scores, maybe a few, um, other descriptive metrics 
um, composite scores probably, or you know, some, some result, maybe you even report the, the correlation scores, the Pearson correlation scores um, in your dashboard, but there isn't a whole lot of expository text. So the focus is on the visualization, whereas um, other reports you're using embedded visualizations into a text report, wherein you have more of an opportunity to explain what's in the, uh, in the visualization itself. And so um, I actually find that um, my tendency, I think this is pretty common, is to create a lot of bar charts, a lot of bar charts in my, in my reports. And so um, one of my recommendations is to uh, you know, vary the types of, of, of visualizations that you're using in your reports. So I have an example of a, a radial graph here, just a, which here is just a different way to represent um, the responded um, age group population. So in this, uh, in this case, um, there's actually a very large subgroup in the 55 to 65, uh, 64, excuse me, age group. So the inner ring is the, is the 25%. So if the dot that corresponds to the age group is below this, um, this ring, uh, it's less than 25%, whereas this age group is um, at nearly 50% of the entire population. And this is by the, uh, the plan group that I talked about in the previous slide. So you know, I like to test out visualizations to see how they, um, how, what kind of reaction they get and if they're intuitive. So some people will really rely on those bar graphs um, and others will, will get more exploratory with great things like radial graphs. Um, but this is an example of the dashboard that I, I put together, which gives you the opportunity to, in Tableau, um, and if anyone has any, um, you know, it's been a few months since we went over Tableau together. If you want a reminder and you're about to go into your, um, into your visualization procedures, I feel free to, to reach out to me so I can help you with that um, about some of the data processing functions or, or, or protocols that you need to implement to get, that, to get that started. But the point of the dashboard is that you just have several visualizations together so that um, there's sort of minimal user need to, to click through um, beyond the, the existing menus in your dashboard. Okay. So, so for statistical analysis, um, I'd say maybe about half of my projects actually get to this level. Most, uh, about the other half stop um, simply at reporting mean scores and then getting Pearson correlations and finding out which questions are the most important drivers of that overall satisfaction uh, metric. Um, there are some times that I need to do a deeper dive into um, imputation and some regression methods. So I have a case study for you here about regression for response rates. And then um, I'll explain um, in some detail about how to use imputation to deal with missing data in a way that's sensitive to everyone who has participated in the survey. So just to back up a bit before I get into the statistics itself, is that um, there's, we're kind of in a transitional period in survey research where um, a lot of the initial work in the field comes, probably you might guess, comes from market research. And so um, much, of the, much of the statistics that we've covered today is actually derived from that field um, and applied specifically to well, things you may see in the media like polling um, or other forms of opinion, opinion measuring research. Um, but at the same time, you know, data science is a growing field um, that, that has its own methodology and its own approach. So the, the main difference between the two is that survey research is more about reporting and analysis of results um, that, that, that have been collected. Um, and data science is more about modeling. Um, putting together the, the model that best represents the, the public's opinion on a certain topic. And so survey research sort of uh, shies away from um, sort of a, some, some advanced methods in um, quantifying opinion that's farther removed from the actual answers on the survey, on the survey that was, that was, uh, that was fielded, whereas data science is interested in putting together a simulation based on the responses that were given to the survey um, itself. So two, two different approaches, but I will say there's some overlap. Um, 
survey research and data science both use imputation methods to, to deal with missing values. Um, and I think, you know, more and more, these fields have become, um, uh, become less distinguishable and borrow methods from each other. So multiple linear regression, you know, um, this is, you know, this is, um, for multiple linear regression, I actually don't use this so too much um, when I'm thinking about how questions drive overall satisfaction. I, I stick with the Pearson correlation because um, it is a metric that um, gets at the different covariance. It already takes into account the covariance between the different questions itself. Whereas in linear regression, there are um, one of the assumptions that's problematic for survey research and the one that I think probably disqualifies it from being used to model the outcome measure, the overall satisfaction, is that there can't be correlation amongst the independent variables. And I've yet to work on a survey where there wasn't, a, where there wasn't significant um, multicollinearity amongst the independent variables. So typically, uh, like a customer service measure will um, be highly correlated with, um, with claims processing if I'm doing a health plan survey. I'm sure you can think about uh, you know, aspects of your work um, different concepts that will end up having a similar pattern of, pattern of responses. And so this is problematic for linear regression um, because you won't be able to tell which is a really a key driver of that overall satisfaction figure. So I actually typically don't use it um, to find out which individual question is the most important or the most, in, uh, the most important individual composite that drives overall satisfaction. It's um, yeah, I just want to emphasize because of that um, fundamental assumption that's being broken about correlation amongst independent variables, and I will get to some methods about how to deal with that. Um, but um, that's in the that's in the different the uh, the advanced uh, lasso and ridge regression section that we'll come to. And so in previous sessions, I've talked um, about weighting and imputation, but I did get, I did get several questions about this since. You know, um, if you're coming from outside survey research, it, there can be some some anxiety about um, getting a missing value, and then um, in order to do some sort of analysis, you want to have complete data. And so the, the term in in survey research and in statistics is imputation, um, which is replacing a missing missing value with an estimated one. And of course, the devil's in the details. How is it that we can uh, we can estimate that value? But more, more generally, um, and I've talked about a, a bit about this before, when we think about polling, which is something a lot of people are familiar with since it's in the news a lot, um, and how um, polling has gone, has gone wrong in recent elections or how it's deviated from the actual response, uh, the actual uh, election results. And so one thing that's talked a lot and has got a lot of media, media attention is actually weighting, uh, weighting of survey responses. And so in this, um, in weighting, what you're actually doing is expanding a subgroup's comp composition uh, among respondents to resemble its composition among the population. So you might know that um, you know maybe 55% of voters are, are women and 45% of voters are men. Um, but the, the survey that you fielded had it more at 50-50. So in order to correct for that, what you could do is take that um, subgroup's um, responses, but then expand it so that it counts for, uh, so if you, so the 50% of respondents are female, that actually becomes uh, weighted so that it's 55% of the entire score um, for the survey report. Um, and this is a method to counteract non-response bias. And uh, it can work um, uh, if the population that, if the, if the people who haven't responded to the survey are similar to those who have responded to the survey. If they, if you would expect that um, portion of women who didn't, um, who didn't answer the survey to answer in a similar way to those who did, then weighting will will have uh, little impact, um, will have little negative impact on your results. However, if there's a specific characteristic about those who did not answer the survey um, that makes them different from the population who did answer the survey, and then you weight them as if they were the same as those who did 
participate in the survey, you're actually going to compound the error um, since you're um, effectively ignoring that specific behavioral characteristic um, that is driving their non their their non participation in the survey, and so that's why um, you know, I don't I think I don't necessarily recommend that you wait um, since I know this is a topic that comes up a lot amongst different racial ethnic ethnic or, or age groups. Um, since you, many of you know the the actual population demographics, I suggest you don't wait them. Um, in this way, since you might be magnifying the, the opinion of people who are responsive to your survey versus those who aren't. However, there I think there is a better method out there, um, and that's called imputation. Um, it can, it's um. So what it can do is that it avoids this problem that waiting has, um, since it doesn't assume that the uh, that those who didn't respond to the survey um, have exactly the same characteristics. But it, um, if you know several characteristics about those who didn't answer the survey, you can actually regress those characteristics on the overall uh, survey respondent population and impute um, a value based on that regression. So that's closer to what you would expect them to answer had they actually responded to the survey itself. Whereas waiting, is typically done on just a single demographic characteristic that doesn't explain the entire um, the entire population's opinion. So, the difference being that in weighting, you're relying on one, you're effectively relying on one variable to explain the entirety of their um, of their opinion. Whereas in imputation in regression imputation, you can take in all of these variables and regress their opinion on all of those, which have much more explanatory power. Explanatory power, and that way you can uh, you can more you can more accurately represent those who haven't responded to your survey. So there are a few uh, a few methods that I typically use in imputation. Um, I have the the regression equation here for imputation, so I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, the the things you want to think about when um, you are talking about imputation are the types of variables that you have, the quantity of missing values, and the randomness. So typically in survey, uh, in survey research, there is a decent amount of randomness to the, um, to the, um, uh, the missing values. So while it may be the case that it's biased in one way, when I talk about randomness, I just mean, is there an entire population that's totally missing? That would be a problem with randomness and you'd be, you might shy away from some of these imputation methods. Um, and then how much of it is missed? How many, how many, um, uh, values are you missing? And so that's more at the record level. Um, are you missing is 90% of the 90% of the values within a certain record? In that case, um, you might be beyond the scope of what imputation can do for you. Um, and so in, in mean imputation, what you're doing is you're just, um, this is, um, you're taking the mean score for the entire population without respect uh, to other individual characteristics, and then just applying that mean score to that person who didn't answer that question. And that can be a problem because you're losing out on information that you might otherwise use. Whereas in regression, you're actually, um, and actually let me skip ahead to the next slide so you can see this. Well, and yeah, we'll get to the case study in a minute, but um, yeah, for, for regression, the uh, for regression imputation, these are all the uh, the variables that you have knowledge about, and then you're actually imputing this here. You're the the result of the imputation uh, by by uh, by regression. So you're actually building on all of the other variables that you have available to you. So it could be age, race, ethnicity to impute whatever that missing value is to that question. And so that could uh, that could even be the answer to a question that's um, in the thematic composite, whereas my case study covers imputation specifically for um, response rate. So I just don't have too much time, but I do jump ahead here just for a minute, because I do want to point out that um, when we're talking about um, you know, diversity in, in survey responses, it's important to use um, imputation in a sensitive way so that we're not um, imputing values that are uh, 
that are incorrect or don't aren't reflective of the that subgroup's opinion. And so I found this nice research paper earlier um, this month that just came out this year from the Urban Institute that have the best practices for for imputation. Um, and in this case, they're actually imputing racial data based on answers to surveys. But it's a nice guide to show you that imputation can be done um, around uh, race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, it just has to be thought out a little bit more clearly. And I think this has, provides a nice framework uh, to get started on that. But um, you know, in my case study um, for, uh, for survey research, I actually use um, linear regression a lot to predict response rates. Um, and that's because you know, I, uh, I, have, I have very large um, survey population, so I'll, I'll often be sending um, surveys to a couple hundred thousand people. And um, one client in particular for a large, uh, a large state wanted to get a certain number of responses from each, um, from each um, HMO. So I think there are about 50 HMOs in this, in this state um, for, for Medicaid members. And in order to have um, a sufficient amount of data to be able to analyze the, the work on their end, they needed us to project the response rate for the 2018 project. Excuse me. And so um, building on the response rates for the 2017 project, I actually had, um, and this was, this was useful, they had demographic information for almost all of the, the participants from 2017 in the survey. Um, and in that way, I was able to create uh, a regression equation that predicted the, um, the probability that an individual respondent would respond to the survey based on their age, age race, ethnicity, and uh, I think their, uh, their region in the state as well was one of my variables. Um, I do want to point out that for this project, I actually didn't do any variable selection. So there was no process to actually eliminate um, variables from the regression equation. And that was largely because um, I wasn't as concerned about uh, multicollinearity because I was just trying to model the response rate. I wasn't really looking at, um, I wasn't modeling opinion in this case. So if, um, so if there was some multicollinearity, I was able to deal with it even if it affected my outcome variable a little bit. Um, whereas if I had eliminated one of the variables, it, I thought the risk was higher that I would change it such that the um, uh, that the, the the outcome measure would be more uh, affected. So I actually used the same equation in 2018, but the problem was they had a bunch of new members in 2018 for which they didn't have um, demographic variables. And so what I did was I took um, census block information down to the zip code level and based on um, the number of people in that uh, census block, uh, the number of people by age, by race, by gender, I imputed a value for that, for that person in that zip code um, according to the mean value um, that they would be. So the average age in the census block might have been 34. And if that person was, um, have a, had a missing value, their imputed age would be 34. And in this way, I was able to, to stabilize and project out response rates for the 2018 project. And that way I actually had a, a response probability for each individual, even if I didn't have specific demographic information for each of them. Um, so it was a combination of evidence from a previous project and combined with imputation from an outside source. And so, one of the one of the out, one of the problems, though, because I didn't do variable selection, um, there was multicollinearity. I knew that, but the 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 problem ended up being that. Oh, I might have gotten a question. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So um, for response rate prediction. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't do variable selection, which meant there was multicollinearity problems. But what this had the, the effect of doing is that um, it actually caused the variance to be larger than it was in real life. So for a group that was very unlikely to respond, it actually 
overcompensated and project a very, very low response rate. But for a population that was much more likely to respond, it over projected, it over predicted how much they would respond. And so this wasn't a problem because I really wanted more responses anyway from those. Uh, I was more nervous about those low response rate groups. So I ended up getting more responses from them than I wanted and fewer from the higher response groups, which is why it was a sort of a manageable problem. Um, but that was led me to the next step, um, which was to actually reduce the number of variables um, in, my, uh, in my regression equation. And so there's a few methods here um, that deal with multicollinearity problems um, that cause overfitting, which is um, really what you can see here. If there's more variance in the, predict in the predicted response rate versus the actual, you have a problem with overfitting your, your regression model. So um, these are actually sort of intro machine learning techniques that you can use um, uh, to reduce the number of variables in your regression equation. I actually use lasso. Um, and so sort of the, the quick and dirty explanation for these two methods is that they're, they're a response to overfitting your method, which is the problem I had because I used too many variables. The, the model was too confident in its predictions. And so actually, these methods make the equation less confident um, through uh, two different methods. I use lasso because um, I wasn't because I actually dropped variables that I didn't need. So in response rate prediction, I wasn't worried about um, people's opinions being affected. So I could drop a race variable at, at the end um, of my analysis and be able to still have a more accurate equation. So that when I ran the project in the next year, um, I could have. I can have uh, predicted values that more uh, that more equally matched the the variance in the real predict uh, the real projected response probability values. So um, feel free to uh, if you have questions about that at the end, I'm happy to answer more about it. Or if you have questions about how to apply those models, I just wanted to give you some um, some techniques. Um, to, to fix a problem that comes up a lot in linear regression with models with variable selection um, that comes up in, in data science approaches to survey research since um, the field is what I was taught originally was to do backward selection in linear in linear regression um, and to just um, and to uh, sort of those more uh, those those methods that pay more attention to p-value differences as you add and take away uh, variables into your model uh, whereas the field is more moving into these these newer methods, which um, use which use matrix matrix algebra to reduce and actually uh, uh, eliminate variables while still keeping a, a, still keeping predictive value that matches the original variance in your linear regression uh, uh, in your actual real um, response uh, prediction probabilities. Okay, so for for survey reporting, you know, I really think of it as two separate, it's really two separate fields. There's data reporting that has uh, mean scores and correlations, which I use most of the time. And then in the second part uh, of, of survey reporting, I'm modeling opinion, which involves imputation, uh, which is estimating, um, estimating a value that's not available to you and then advanced regression approaches to um, find ways to get at, um, um, uh, to get at public opinion um, that's not um, that's one step removed from their actual answers, but may actually um, have a better estimation of what your population thinks instead of the the smaller sample that you've collected, which ideally would be perfectly representative of your population. And survey researchers would would definitely um, lean that way, um, but the data science approach is more in the opposite direction of modeling what the uh, the population things based on the, 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 the likely bias sample that you've collected. So um, this is the, the, last, uh, the last workshop that we have in, uh, in quantitative survey work. So uh, well, it's been great uh, chatting with you all about your survey projects, um, especially in a time when, when so much is changing and hearing about, um, yeah, hearing about the different methods that you employ to uh, to interact with your your with your, with student opinions, um, so appreciate your appreciate your your interesting projects and the feedback that I've gotten um, so far.
but yeah, there's a few takeaway points for, for survey research um, that I like to emphasize. Um, so the, the five key things, and that's to design a survey that operationalizes your concepts of interest. So you don't want to go right into your survey and then write questions without thinking about what concepts you want to study. You want to think about those concepts first and then design the questions on top of that. Um, you definitely want to limit your survey to your target population. Um, so those are the people who have visited your library or who are interested in your services. Um, seems like some got some got a little bit deleted, but um, create descriptive visualizations that um, use in your um, in your exploratory work so you can understand uh, what you're doing for exploratory analysis when you're doing your correlations and your mean scoring. Um, you need to create thematic composites um, and identify composites that drive the overall outcome score. So these composites are those that, um, uh, that should map to the concepts you were thinking about when you're operationalizing your original research project. Um, and then you want to run those correlations, which I find most useful to find out what drives overall satisfaction. And then finally, be aware, uh, be aware of when to implement, implement imputation strategies to represent missing values, depending on um, whether you want to model opinion or whether you're reporting the opinions that you've gathered from, from your survey work. So, just wanted to, yeah, thank you for your, for your attention during this, this session. And if you're able to attend the previous ones for, for that as well. And I think we have a, a few minutes for questions as, uh, as well. So feel free to jump in. Kevin, this is Sue. I wanted to thank you for for the, your discussion and presentation this afternoon. And, and I, had, I imagine in your work, and I know colleagues who are also in this training have done a variety of reporting and writing of papers, et cetera. Do you have an opinion or, and, and or advice uh, about um, the number of visualiz visualizations or tables and charts, et cetera, that you put into a report or a paper? Um, and or just thoughts about you know, you want to tell the story, whatever the story is, uh, and do it in a variety of ways. But do you have an opinion about that piece of writing, presenting reports or a paper, whatever it might be? Yeah, um, you know, I've seen sort of a, a transition in the way the reports have been developed in survey research, whereas before, I, I think they they start with sort of large descriptive visualizations. And then only at the end of the report would you get to the more meaningful results. But I've seen a reversal in that to really give the more meaningful results first. So to show correlations in the beginning and then to provide so, uh, cross tabs or the larger, the very large uh, visualizations at the end that describe the answers to each question. Um, I, think, I think that's been an improvement, at least amongst the people that I work with. I have noticed that they um, have a better grasp of the main outcome. So, I think I think my my preference is to uh, is to front load sort of the executive summary version of those visualizations in the front of the report, um, and then to provide the larger descriptive visualizations at the end that people can page through um, if they have additional questions. Do other colleagues on the session have a question for Kevin? So while you colleagues might be thinking, Kevin, would you again share your email address so that if colleagues uh, want to kind of circle back to you about um, you know, creating putting data together and putting it into a report or um, a, a, you know, a paper, um, they can give you a call for, for consultation or email you for consultation. Absolutely. And so we'll provide the link to that, that study from the Urban Institute that I think is, is useful for, for imputation and just um, generally as a, as a way to, to grapple with issues of diversity and representation in survey work. Great, thank you.
Kevin, what did you share? You shared a post attendee, the link. Oh, yes. Oh, I should. Oh, I shared the wrong link. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, there, I think that's the, the correct link to the Durban yeah. Institute study. Great, thank you. Well, if there are no questions uh, for Kevin at the moment, we can let you go a couple minutes early. Um, thank you, Kevin. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday and uh, Reminder to everyone, if you if you have other colleagues, I know there's a number of people who have signed up for the workshop on Thursday, but if you have other colleagues that you think might be interested, you know, please please let them know to, to register. And if you need the registration link, can shoot, shoot me an email and I can send it out uh, to everyone. Um, but thank you all. It's good to see you and we'll, we'll see you again. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone.